This is level two of the CFA program, the topic on portfolio management and the reading on exchange traded funds, mechanics and applications. Let me quickly take you to the first two LOSs here. Explain creation and redemption process of exchange traded funds. Describe how exchange traded funds are traded in the secondary market. Let me go back to my introductory slide and I would like to start with a quick example, an analogy that's probably not a perfect analogy, but I think it's going to serve our purpose well, especially since the two authors of this reading suggest uh, in multiple spots that while ETFs on the surface level are very simple and easy to understand, mostly because of their similarities with mutual funds, but on another level, and a different layer, they can be fairly complex. And the authors even use the term confusing in, in their reading. So what I'm hoping to do is that this example will kind of wipe out any confusion that you might have, especially as it relates to those first two LOSs. <clears throat> so here we go. Bear with me for just a few moments. Let's suppose that I'm Jim and I have a beautiful Honeycrisp apple tree in my backyard. And my apple tree produces these huge, juicy apples. My neighbors love the apples. I let them come and pick the apples when they're walking their dogs uh, around the neighborhood. Everyone loves Jim's Honeycrisp apples. You're my neighbor. You love my Honeycrisp apples. And you've come up with a really super idea of how we can all benefit from Jim's apple tree in a manner that exceeds our current benefit of eating apples while we're walking our dogs. Now, one of the reasons this, that this example is not going to be a perfect example is because the apples will uh, deteriorate and they'll get worms in them. And so we have to preserve those things. So you come up with this idea. You're my neighbor, remember? You say, hey, Jim, I am buying a refrigerator slash freezer. And what I'm going to do with this refrigerator slash freezer is I'm going to put it in my front yard and it's going to be glass so you can see it from all four sides. And what I would like to do is I would like for you to pick a whole bunch of your apples and put them in these rows and we'll stack them in columns and rows like a big matrix so that everybody can see them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have lights flash throughout this freezer slash refrigerator. And I'm going to have a different light every day. One day it's purple, one day it's green, yellow, et cetera, et cetera. So I say, all right, this sounds like a crazy idea, but go ahead. I'll pick some apples and I'll put them in your freezer and that will preserve them so that so that they don't uh, rot and get worms in them so that we can appreciate these apples for a really long time, let's say. So I pick the apples, I put them in there and the neighbors come by and they see this, they see the apples and they say, boy, these are so beautiful. It's really, really cool about this. And so I'm looking at this freezer and you're looking at this freezer and I'm saying, you know what? I'm, I'm not sure I'm benefit benefiting from this. And you say, wait a minute, Jim, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you shares of ownership in this freezer and you can have access to your apples but the apples belong in this freezer think of it as a trust but you own that trust and i'll give you a bunch of shares of ownership in that trust and you can do with those shares with what you want so we look at this freezer one day it's blue one day it's red and the neighbors come by and they say you know what let's let's start a lottery let's see if we can win some money Every day we're going to bet on whether or not it's red or green or blue or whatever, whatever colors are out there. So this brings tremendous enthusiasm with the neighbors. It's a focal point. We get together and we talk out there. What color is it going to be? And remember, you get to pick the color every day. And that's a secret. You're going to keep that a secret. So now I'm thinking, you know what? I have these shares over there and it's nice. You know, my apples are over there, but I have people over in the neighboring uh, area and they come over and they say, Hey Jim, can you sell me some of your shares of that freezer that contains the apple? And I'll say, you know what? That's not a bad idea. I'll sell you a bunch of these shares. And in fact, somebody from the New York Apple Exchange, let's call it that, they come in and say, you know what? If we go over in the secondary market, 
we can trade these not just with the people in your neighborhood and the people over there in that neighborhood, but people all over the world. All right, so now we're getting everybody involved in this. So what do we do? The value of those apples depends on the volatility and the price of the apples and the bet that my neighbors and your neighbors make on the color of the lightning bolts that go through that go through the freezer. Wow. Now, the greatest thing about all of this is that me, what I do is that I can look in that freezer and I see all those apples and I know what the value is. But everybody who's betting on the color and the volatility of the apples, they are subject to human error. Remember all that stuff we talked about in behavioral finance. You know, we make cognitive errors and we make judgment errors, errors of the heart, right? We call those behavioral biases. And so the price on that New York Apple Exchange might not be the exact same value that I know as Jim, the Apple owner, I know what that value is. So what I get to do is I get to perform some arbitrage and I can jump into the market. I can redeem my shares. I can create new shares. I can go over to the secondary market. I can do all sorts of things. So I'm making potentially arbitrage profits, which might be huge. So this is my incentive. Your incentive is that every day when those things are traded on the floor of the exchange, a little piece of it comes off and flows to you so you can pay your salary and you can pay for the refrigeration and you can pay for the freezer. Everyone else is happy because they get to bet on the color and they get to bet on the volatility of the apple. And this is pretty much what an exchange traded fund looks like. Everyone is happy. So in a few slides, we're going to explain the creation, redemption, and then trading in the secondary market. And I'm going to harken back to my example. And then the final LOSs are super simple because we've seen these before. We've seen premiums and discounts. We've seen bid ask spreads. We've seen tracking error. We've talked about risk. So if we get over the confusing part of the first two LOSs, the rest of them are fairly easy. So we should be able to get through this slide deck in, uh, in a quick fashion. All right, so let's go ahead and forget about the apples for just a second. What's an, what's an exchange, exchange traded fund? an investment fund that tracks an index and trades on secondary markets. All right, so that's pretty much the initiation and the innovation of an ETF, where we wanted to get exposure to an index. And so you ought to be thinking, well, you know what, Jim, there's tons and tons of mutual funds out there. And while that's true, the creation and redemption process for the apples that I just spoke about allows for a reduction in fees and commissions and all sorts of things with the ETF that's not enjoyed by the investment in mutual funds. So there are advantages here. Now, this relies on a group of people called authorized participants. So these are the APs and they're probably market makers, although they could be anybody. And in my example, I, I'm the AP. I'm the market maker. I own the apples and I, I traded the apples <clears throat> to you as my neighbor, and you traded ownership shares in your refrigerator. <clears throat> so we're participating in the creation and the redemption process. And so most of these are in kind. Now, my example, remember I said it wasn't perfect. I gave you apples and you gave me shares of ownership. But with an ETF, if I'm the authorized participant, like a financial institution who's a market maker, I already have tons of these shares. And so I send you tons of shares instead of apples, and you send me shares in the ETF, so an in-kind transaction. And what that's going to do is that's going to make for the potential for tax efficiency that we'll see uh, just about in a few minutes. All right, the creation basket. There's the refrigerator or the freezer. We have all these apples in there. So the creation basket is the list of securities that are going to go into the exchange traded fund. And these are disclosed every day. And that's why I gave you the example where it was clear glass. So you could see each of those apples. And that's what happens with this creation basket. Every day, you as the ETF, ETF uh, owner, you get to see what's in that fund which is an advantage that you have over the mutual fund. 
Uh, the creation unit is the lot size. This is really a, a fascinating um, on, on one level, but kind of a dull thing on another level that um, most of these creation units are done in 50,000 shares, but they don't really have to be. They could be 20 or 30,000 or 200,000 or 600,000. But the market seems to have focused on, uh, on 50,000. Now there's a primary market and a secondary market. So when I put my apples into your into your freezer, that was a primary market transaction. So with an ETF, you've got this exchange of shares for shares. That's the creation. Remember, primary market is the creation of a financial security. Now you as my neighbor, you're what's known as the ETF issuer or the sponsor. You could probably think of it as the fund manager because you picked me and my apples. But the way this works in the financial industry is that you and I, we, we probably work for the same financial institution. Maybe it's you know the Gibraltar Rock Financial Institution and you work for it and I work for it. I'm a market maker and maybe you're just some kind of a manager and you say, hey, let's make a ton of money on Jim's Apple ETF. And this is the way it works. Now, the the sponsor doesn't have to work for the same firm as the issuer. I mean, I could just be Jim and I could say, you know what, I, I want to create an ETF and I might call a financial institution over there. I probably already covered most of these here. Mutual fund shares. Yes. What do you know? And you guys don't need me to tell you this, right? Closing net asset value at the end of the day. That's what you trade at. And you send the mutual fund manager cash and then you get shares. Um, uh, ETF shares, you can trade at the value, whether it goes up or down during the course of the day, just like a regular old share of stock, and you can trade at the closing net asset value. But remember that those ETF shares, they depend on the creation unit and that relationship between me, Jim, the apple guy, and you, my neighbor, and how we arrange where those apples are going to fit in on uh, inside of the freezer. All right, so that first LOS, explain the creation redemption process. Oh boy, I sure hope I've eliminated any confusion here. So let's go ahead and read and read some, some of these. So the authorized participant acquires securities in a creation basket from probably their own inventory, or they can just go to the New York Stock Exchange and buy these. They deliver the basket of securities to the fund manager, the ETF manager, in exchange for a bunch of shares in the ETF. Hmm. Now, the redemption process is just the opposite. If I don't want my apples any longer, then I can tell you, hey, I don't want those apples anymore. And so it works in just the reverse order. All right, functions of the APs. Market makers, all right, so you know what am I? I was the apple grower, and so financial institutions, they, they act as market makers, approved by the ETF manager to participate in the creation and redemption process. Ah, they are the only investors who can create or redeem new shares of an ETF. So over in the secondary market, those are shares of the ETF that have already been created based on the agreement between the sponsor and the AP. Other functions, and this is probably a pretty good uh, exam question here, lower costs. So this in-kind creation redemption, it eliminates lots of transaction costs. Uh, that creation and redemption is not a taxable event, so there's one extra tax efficiency in there, in addition to the simple fact that when you buy or sell the ETF, you get to pick when you buy or sell, so you get to pick when you want to pay that capital gain, but if you buy the mutual fund, you know, the fund manager is buying and selling shares of stock in there all the time, so you get hit with these capital gains uh, on April 15th. And then that, uh, that third diamond point, this is a really good one. This is the fascinating one to me as Jim, the owner of this apple tree and the owner of the refrigerator. Um, what I get to do is I get to find arbitrage opportunities. And so if the price is too high, I can do something. If the price is too low, I can do something. I mean, I can take long positions. I can take short positions. And what's going to happen is that because I know I know the value of those apples 
And as the AP, the AP knows the value of what's inside of that creation unit. Whenever they, those, those prices on the exchange, whether it's an organized exchange or an over-the-counter market, that then the AP steps in and moves those prices back to their true value. That's why ETFs don't have substantial premiums or discount. Now they still will, but it won't be substantial. Like, do you remember in the old days? And when, and when I say old days, I mean, you know, most today as well. But in the old days, when closed end mutual funds were super popular, now there's just a handful of these things that trade out there. I mean, they could sell at substantial, I mean, substantial discounts, like 70% or 80%. Uh, they probably didn't sell at 130% premium, but they could get far away from their, uh, from their fair market value. Now, the uh, authorized participants, they absorb the costs. So we, uh, the, the ETF traders bear more of those costs and the APs pay for all costs. And so what happens is that that, that uh, net asset value includes all of the costs that are associated with managing the ETF. So I collect this, right, as I'm selling, creating or redeeming, I collect this and they're collected on the exchanges as well. And those, those things flow to you as the sponsor so you can pay yourself a salary and pay for the refrigerator. Now here's where it gets uh, uh, a little bit more simple. So the secondary market involves buying and selling ETFs on the exchanges. And what's super important is we have this National Securities Clearing Corporation. You remember when we had our conversations with equity markets and with fixed income markets and then with options markets and, and futures markets and swap markets, there has to be somebody out there who's keeping track of all of these. And so there's a clearing, uh, a clearing house that does all of this. They guarantee the exchange trade. So the guarantee over there of people buying and selling shares of ownership in Jim's Honeycrisp apples substantially increases the liquidity because people out there in, you know, in Canada or Iceland, they could say, well, I, I live way far away. I don't, I don't know what the current state of Jim's apples look like. Maybe, maybe he's infested with worms. Maybe his neighbor uh, uh, didn't pay the electric bill and the refrigeration now becomes a heater and those skins are wrinkling on all of the apples. You know, I'm clearly making all this stuff up, but you can see the point is that that clearing house um, advances and promotes and maintains liquidity. Uh, the authorized participant two to six days settlement period. I'm not sure if that's too terribly important. Um, however, in other countries throughout the world, there are different there are different rules, and so the fees and the bid ask spreads and all those other kinds of trading costs might be different outside of the United States. Uh, ETFs, of course, they're listed on multiple exchanges. Everybody wants to get in. That's that example with my neighbors, right? They were betting on the blue or the green. And then the people living in neighboring areas, well, they want to get into on it as well. And they might not like the New York, what did I call it? The New York Apple Exchange. Maybe they want to go over there to the, the, the Canadian Apple Exchange and do it there. So, of course, these are traded on multiple markets. Here's a super simple illustration of the primary market and then the secondary market. This is what I have been talking about uh, for the last 15 minutes or so. So now we can move on to stuff that we've already learned before in the CFA program. So let's go ahead and talk about tracking error. And I always tell my students, and I mentioned this on recordings, that if, if you think of tracking error as uh, some kind of measure of an error, and if you think about it in terms of a standard deviation, this, this probably reduces it to its simplest form. In fact, the reading in our slide gives us this definition, uh, the annualized standard deviation. Remember, standard deviation measures the average degree of error. You know, sometimes you're going to err above, sometimes you're going to err below. And if you take the average of those errors and you compute it into some big old formula, you get what's known as a standard deviation. And so the standard deviation is the standard deviation of the difference between 
what that net asset value is. And remember, you know, we can do the net asset value trade by trade. We'll probably do it by the end of the day when we're computing this annualized standard deviation. And then we're comparing it to some kind of a benchmark. Remember what I said earlier, maybe I could emphasize this a little bit more now in this presentation, that most ETFs are designed to track some kind of an index. And it doesn't have to be exactly an index like the S&P 500 index, although there are tons of ETFs that do that. I mean, it could be a particular location in the matrix of a particular sector, you know, like large cap pharmaceutical companies that pay at least a 4% dividend yield. You know, so you have a whole bunch of firms like that. So it doesn't have to be the standard index. It could be an index which is unique that will attract particular investors who are trying to fill in the gaps of their portfolios. Remember, we, we call that spanning. All right, so what are the sources of tracking error? You know, what's the goal of lots of investors? It's the, the goal always sounds like, you know, minimize risk. Well, of course, we want to minimize tracking error as we're, as we're locating that specific index or some kind of a benchmark. So what are some simple sources of track, tracking error? We've talked about this before in multiple parts of the CFA program. Uh, index changes, of course. We know that the S&P 500 changes because it has the largest 500 companies, right? Well, those largest 500, they, they change pretty regularly. Uh, indexes don't hold cash, but uh, ETF, just like mutual fund managers, will have uh, cash holdings. And there's probably a lag in between cash and reinvesting, so that'll probably contribute to it. Uh, operating expenses and operating fees and then if you have if you have like let's do the Wilshire 5000 which of course doesn't hold uh, it doesn't own 5000 stocks I think in 2022 it's about 3800 different stocks but if we want to have an ETF that tracks the Wilshire 5000 we may not want to go and buy all of those 5000 uh, all of those 3,800 stocks, right? We may want to do sampling or optimization strategies. So once again, what I encourage you to do, and I love these exam questions, is to link LOSs in one reading to another. So go back to quantitative methods and remind yourself about sampling and optimization because that link could appear in the question stem. And you might have to answer a question on which is the best strategy to sample. And then you might have to answer a question on ETFs. I love those kinds of questions. Uh, sometimes we don't really actually own the shares. We own those uh, depository receipts or some other kind of a security that mimics, but not perfectly, the returns on a particular share of stock or a group of share of stocks. Uh, fund accounting practices, regulatory and uh, tax requirements, and then uh, unique to the fund, the fund manager can lend out the securities for those who want to short. Uh, there's all sorts of issues investing in stocks that are outside of the domicile of the ETFs. You know, for example, here in the United States, if we're investing in Icelandic uh, securities or Japanese securities or Canadian securities, well, there's probably different rules, tax rules for dividends. There might be rules for repatriating those funds. I mean, there are all different sorts of ways that those decisions by the manager to invest in global securities could contribute to that tracking error. Now, I love LOSs that use the words bid ask spreads because it's close to my heart. Back when I was a researcher, uh, my buddy and I, we published several articles on bid ask spreads, and this is the kind of stuff that we found. So, you know, the bid price is uh, always going to be lower than the ask price. It's kind of a built in way for market makers and um, and those traders on the floors of organized exchanges to be able to buy low and sell high. And so the wider these spreads are, 
the more penal it is, the more severe it is for regular old investors like you and I to generate profits. And so these are great exam questions. And the way I envision this showing up on the exam is up in the question stem, you'll have two ETFs and they'll give you characteristics of those two ETFs. And the Institute might say, hey, which one of these two or three or 10, right, is gonna have the lowest bid ask spread and the most narrow or the, or the widest. And so these should be obvious notions here. So the liquidity uh, of the security. So these ETFs that have bigger trading volume, they're gonna have more narrow spreads. Uh, order flow of the shares um, underneath that are inside of the, of the refrigerator, right? All those different apples, all those different shares. So both of those, you know, you think of liquidity and order flow as similar, but they're a little different. And then of course, competition among market makers, that makes perfect sense. The more competition, the, the more narrow the spread. Uh, and then costs associated with the uh, authorized participant and the sponsor and all that stuff to provide a cover for liquidity. And then my favorite, and this is what my buddy and I, uh, we tested about volatility, increases with volatility. So if you, have, if you have an ETF that goes way up and way down, then of course those spreads are gonna be wider. Uh, how about if we look specifically at some of the combination of factors that are going to contribute to this? And so notice there are some pluses and minuses here. So the pluses, um, will be direct relationship, the minuses will be indirect relationship. And notice there's a plus minus for creation and redemption fees and all other trading costs. So uh, and sometimes this is a wash, the pluses outweigh, uh, are exactly equal to the minuses, but sometimes they're not because creation has one cost, redemption has another cost, and then direct trading costs are impacted in there. And so they could either have direct or indirect relationship there. Uh, the bid ask, bid ask spreads of the underlying assets held in the ETF. Of course, that makes sense. If you have if you have a bunch of stocks that have a wide bid ask spreads, then the ETF is going to have a wide bid ask spread. Uh, compensation for the risk of hedging or carrying positions for the remainder of the trading day. Well, this is probably more uh, relevant for ETFs that hold derivative contracts in there. Let's just take the obvious example. Um, you know, in my Jim's Honeycrisp ETF, we actually had the Honeycrisp apples in there. But somebody who's really smart over in another neighborhood might just say something like, you know what, I don't want to waste all my time like Jim did in planting the tree, in watering the tree, in fertilizing the tree, and all those kinds of things. How about if I just use a Honeycrisp futures contract. I could do the same thing over there. So that third one is probably more relevant for, for derivatives. Uh, desired profit, of course, what every market maker wants to make a ton of money on every trade. Uh, of course, what's preventing he or she from establishing a wide spread so that they can pocket all of that profitability are things like integrity and all of those standards that we had back in, uh, you know, what do we do? We first learned that in level one and we continue learning it in level two. But then of course, what layers this desired profit spread is that there are going to be other market makers out there. So competition as well. And then of course, let's look at the last one there, likelihood of receiving an offset e an offsetting ETF in a short time interval. So if we've got lots of order flow and the authorized participant and the sponsor, and then all of the individuals who are operating on the floor of the exchanges, if there can be offsetting orders quickly, then this, this will have an impact. Uh, what did I say earlier? These premiums and discounts are not going to be substantial, and it's going to be because the AP is engaging in arbitrage opportunities all the time. So you, you don't need me to read these to you, right? Market price greater than net asset value, that's a premium. And there are some good equations down there for both the uh, daily or the end of day or the intraday premiums or discounts. How about some sources of premiums and discounts? So what are we saying that those, those are not going to be substantial? 
when they do exist, the AP is going to jump in and move those values back to the true market value and the true, uh, the true value, the true fair value of, of those underlying securities. And so these are pretty much just kind of standard thoughts about the mechanics of trading. So timing difference, exchange, closing times differ. Um, you know, so Jim's Apple ETF could close trading at one o'clock in the afternoon, but the apples underneath, maybe the farmer's market is a 24 hour market. So timing differences, that makes, that makes perfect sense, which means that sometimes there might be stale prices in there as well in that the ETF being that it's not traded right at, what did I say earlier, just a minute ago, one, one o'clock. So maybe that's not traded for a handful of hours or minutes or days. I mean, whatever that in interval is. So the prices become stale. Uh, here's another simple one, costs of owning an ETF. So remember, probably the good exam question is the difference between implicit and explicit. So the explicit are, uh, the management fees, the, com the commissions, and then any, any kind of profits or losses that may or may not be taxable. So implicit of owning the ETF. So these are implicit that you pay, but you don't ever write a check that says, you know, pay to the order of tracking error, bid ask spread or premium or discount. Uh, management fees and trading costs. And even though this LOS says something like describe the costs, uh, we, what we've done for you over on the right is take a look at some equations. So I want you to look at the top right here. If you take the round trip trading costs and you add the management fees, you get the total costs. All right, so think about those as the total cost, but then we can further break down the round trip trading costs. So look down on the bottom right now, that becomes purple. We take the round trip commission and the spread. And so if you look at the purple management fees, right, and the round trip commission and the spread, remember those three, that gives you the total cost. So this is really not a calculate um, the total cost, but describe. So you need to know those inputs. So you probably won't have to do it mathematically, but you'll have to do it um, at least thematically or philosophically. Oh, we've talked about risks ever since we started our level one discussion. So settlement risks. Once again, this is probably relevant for uh, fund managers who use derivatives because settling uh, might be different. And then you can short, you can use collateral. So remember settlement risk and security lending. Uh, fund closures, uh, just like in the old days, remember I said old days of these closed end mutual funds, they closed for tons and tons of reasons, but they kept trading right on the New York Stock Exchange or wherever they were traded. But here, so, sometimes when these close, they just close for good. and there's a big risk up there. ETFs may close on a short notice. So remember that one. And here are some reasons why they close. Fund regulations, competition, mergers and acquisitions, or um, creation halts. And this is probably more true over in the ETN market, the exchange traded notes, because you can be super, super creative in those things. And then there are a handful of investor related risks that we probably know about from all of our previous discussions. Now, I like this last uh, LOS, identify and describe portfolio uses. So what are we going to do? Efficient portfolio management. All right. So why do we want these things? You know, if you go back to the 1950s and Harry Markowitz, he, he taught us how to pick the best, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 stocks and put them in an optimal portfolio so that they're located on the efficient frontier. So whenever I read or hear about a motivation to increase the efficiency of our portfolio, I always think back to Harry Markowitz, and that's probably a good way for you guys to think about this. How can we improve efficiency? So think about the efficient frontier, right? There's that curve, the locus of points. And what are we trying to do? I always give my students this envision. Pretend that we are, we are the offensive line for a football team. And we're these big, big, strong, massive guys who are trying to push the efficient frontier upwards and to the left, right? We want, we want more return and we want less risk. So all of these reasons can be summarized by us playing on a football field. And that's what we're trying to do. 
So we want to manage liquidity. That makes perfect sense. We want to rebalance our portfolios because there's tremendous liquidity in the ETF market and maybe we can push. Now, remember, when I say push, it's not like we're going to push and we're going to all of a sudden end up way at the top left of the quadrant on our graph. But when I mean push, boy, incrementally, even if we can get, oh, five basis points, 10 basis points, either of an increase in return or a reduction in standard deviations. Uh, portfolio completion. I love this one. I, I tell you guys regularly that in the academic world, we call this spanning. You know, we used to span equities, fixed income and cash, right? But now we're slicing this up. And the CFA Institute is, is such a pioneer in things like alternative investments. But now with ETFs, right, we're spanning. So we're trying to, boy, what does the reading call it? portfolio completion, fill in gaps in strategic exposure and comma. Maybe you could put this in parentheses. Portfolio completion means, of course, being consistent with the long term risk and return objective of the client inside of the policy statement. But it also allows for tactical moves, short term moves. Hey, let me do what did I say earlier, you know, the large cap pharmaceutical companies that pay a high dividend yield, maybe I can tactically uh, invest in that for one or two or four months. Uh, transition management, this is broad exposure. So it's almost like pre-investing or post-investing. Management of asset class exposure, right. Core index exposure to various asset and sub-asset classes. That's what I was talking about in that far right quadrant. And look at the second embedded circle point, tactical strategies. That's what I was talking about before. And then there are lots of fund managers out there. And this, this probably relates more to the fixed income ETFs than it does to the equity ETFs. Oh, there's really nothing preventing um, ETFs to be constructed with those creation and redemption ideas that, that they can allow for these factor exposures. Oh my gosh, a portfolio might have some missing risk factor allocations. And so the ETF not only can fill the span, right? But it can identify uh, locus points on that span so that we can move the efficient frontier up and to the left. Uh, active and factor investment. So this is just a little bit more what I was saying earlier. So what we can do is we can find alternative weighting schemes. You know, if, if we have the S&P 500 index and we have 500 stocks and they have to be perfectly uh, market value weighted, I mean, just scratch your heads to be able to do that every day. It takes a lot of effort and probably takes a lot of uh, capital to do that. And so maybe we'll just say something like, you know what, let's overweight this, let's underweight this and look under alternative weight. Seek out performance. Uh, that sounds beautiful. But look at risk management up there. Um, ETFs that are less volatile will probably have lower volatility return profile. So you can use betas and currencies and duration to do this. Uh, how about discretionary active uh, ETF. So this is reputational fixed incomes. This is what I was saying just a few moments ago. And then dynamic asset allocation and multi-asset strategies. Boy, we spent a lot of time in level two talking about uh, reallocation and rebalancing. And there are all these different strategies. And one super easy way is just to layer the portfolio with an ETF. So let me go ahead and quickly summarize. If you can get through the confusion of those first two LOSs, then I think the other ones, you know, fall pretty quickly in line with what we've talked about in the past. So those first two are unique to ETFs. And I think if you think about them as unique to ETFs and compare those to regular old mutual funds, the, the confusion or the fog ought to be lifted.